Hello and welcome to a small video about reusing a Nimble chassis. So this is a Nimble HF40 and it's an older chassis that is sort of out of warranty and out of support from Nimble. And this particular chassis has the hard drive uh, bay disc holders but no drives. There's no drives in it at all. And the Nimble OS that would normally be on the computers inside of here have been, has been erased, so there's no software. So it's effectively a dead machine. So the question is, can we use this for something? Can we convert it into a network attached storage device ourselves and make some use of the nice uh, hardware? And the answer is yes, you can. And in this video, I'm gonna sort of walk you through how to do it. All you need is just the Nimble chassis and you need the serial port cable, which Nimble sells, you can make one as well. It's a 1 8 audio jack to a DB9, which plugs into a, a port on the back so you can get to the serial console. And so we will walk through what you need to do to convert this into something that we could uh, practically use. So let's get started. Okay, so you can see that the, the chassis itself is made by HP, and this is an HP chassis. Um, using their, their boards designed for this configuration. And you see that it's got two modules um, plus two power supplies, and then of course all the driveway stuff in the front. And so if you pop open this here, it will slide out one of the modules. So we can pull out one of the two main CPU modules. Um, and what you can see is that it is a dual CPU, they often come in single CPU, this is a dual CPU version, and this little plastic tray pops up here and comes off, so we can pull that off. And, you know, inside we have the two CPUs, this, this motherboard itself, this sort of side board, and then a little board back here with the interface to the rest of the system. And this top piece comes off, normally you have to unscrew it here in the back, and then this comes off and this has two of these edge cards that go down into PCI bus connectors. And so this back piece holds um, three PCI Express adapters. Normally there are network adapters in there. And so when you have this module off, you can then add or remove cards from it. And then the actual chassis itself is, uh, this part here is an actual somewhat generic board made by Intel. So it's a motherboard made by Intel. And looking at the part number on the board, I was able to find the manuals for this particular board. And it's meant to be a board used for OEM uh, system design. Um, and then this little sideboard here was made for this chassis that takes one of the PCI Express buses, connects it to the LSI controllers. You'll notice there are some M.2 slots here for putting in additional um, SATA M2 drives, um, and then of course the interface to the rest of the system. There are a couple other kind of neat things. One thing you'll notice is this here is a battery, and the battery has a cable that eventually makes its way, and I can pull it out here. I have it disconnected right now. It normally runs down the side of the memory, and then it goes into the back of one of the DIMMs, and it's a special DIMM, and I have it pulled out here. And so this is a memory DIMM that has on it a little power interface right there um, and a dedicated controller. And this is basically a non-volatile DDR4 memory. And so the power provided by the battery or by the system um, enables this to maintain what's in the memory when you power the machine off. And the idea is this can be used for caching. So you can use it as caching RAM, but if you lose power, uh, the contents of the cache are still in the RAM, and when this boots up again, the Nibble software can look at it again and go, oh yeah, I was in the middle of writing something, I'll finish that right out. So it allows you to do fast write caching into RAM, um, but have it be battery backed up. And this is all sort of off the shelf stuff. Um, the slots are generic, there's nothing special about the memory slots. These DIMMs just fit into a slot um, and have the battery backup mechanism uh, plugged into them. So the question is, what can we do with this system now? Uh, so the first thing is that you'll need the little serial adapter that Nimble sells and you can make one that gives you access to the serial console and it plugs into a little jack on the back of the system. 
and that gives you a serial port output. And if you watch this, uh, when the machine boots, you'll kind of see it very, very quickly flash through a somewhat standard looking-ish boot screen, very quickly flashes through it, and then instantly tries to boot the Nimble OS, which on this platform is not there, so it just hangs. Um, if you like record it with a camera and look at it, you'll see that it is like a BIOS boot screen. Um, and it even says hit F2 to enter the BIOS. So if you're very quick uh, over the serial port, you can hit F2 and then ask you for the password to get into the BIOS, at which point we're stuck. But in looking at the service manual, it turns out there are four jumpers here on the motherboard. And let me zoom in here a bit on those. So there are four jumpers right here. And the second of the black jumpers is the password clear jumper. And so if you shorten that jumper and then boot it up, it clears the password. And if you're pretty quick with F2 when this is booting, you can then get into the BIOS. And once you're in the BIOS, there's a couple of critical things you have to do to make this usable. The first is normally there are little black plastic covers over these two USB ports. So pull those off. There's also one over this management port. And in the BIOS, you can enable this USB port, which is disabled in the configuration that Nimble has it in. So you can enable those, so you can plug in a keyboard there if you need to. You can also enable the BMC, and most importantly, you can configure the BMC with an IP address and a username and a password. And that's critical, because with that turned on, then you can go into the machine via the BMC and get a video output, which then enables you to sort of do other things. One other important thing is that in the BIOS, there are two watchdog counters. One's related to the BIOS itself loading, and then one to the OS. You want to turn both of those off, the OS one in particular. If you don't, then you'll be working on it, and every 10 minutes the machine will just mysteriously reboot because that watchdog timer expires. Clearly, the Nimble OS must reset that on a regular basis, the idea being that if the OS hangs, it will basically auto-reboot. Uh, but you want to turn that off until you figure out a way to implement a, a, a timer if you want that functionality. Um, there are a few other things in the BIOS you can tweak, but most of it's pretty obvious um, in order to get it to work. There is a video output on the board. It is uh, this little white connector right there, and it's a little 12-pin little connector, um, and I was able to find the matching connector for that, and the, and the um, pinouts for it is in the service manual for this board, um, and so you, in theory, could use that to get a VGA output if you want to get a VGA output, but you can do everything via the BMC um, without, without even uh, having to use the VGA output. So once you make this BIOS changes, you can then log into the BMC and power the machine up and down, of course. And most importantly is get a view of the console um, and a keyboard. And since you've enabled the USB ports and USB booting, you can then put in a USB key, in my case, uh, a Debian distribution, and you can install Linux. Um, you can even install it on the M.2 flash that's on the board. Uh, it installs just fine, reboots, recognizes everything. All the LSI chipsets are standard chipsets, so they're all recognized. The board itself is a very generic board. Um, and everything pops up, and you have a functional system. And even the cache memory is recognized by Linux as a, as a, as a non-volatile device. It shows up as a device called PMEM, and it looks like a, a hard drive. So it could be an 8-gig hard drive that is backed up by this NV feature. Um, and so you could use that, I think, in a ZFS array as a cache drive. I haven't tried it yet. Um, that's one thing I need to do, uh, but I think it probably is possible. So with that in mind, you do those changes, you get a generic uh, Linux distribution installed, and then you can have a fully working system. Uh, normally, they have relatively slow CPUs. I think this had two, like, silver 4200s, maybe. Um, I put in some medium-powered platinum CPUs in these ones. Um, obviously easy to change out. It, they also only had, I think, maybe 64 megabytes of RAM. It's just pretty easy to upgrade it to, you know, 2v6, I think, up to a terabyte of memory total. Um, so that's something easy you can do. Uh, you'll notice that these cables here are SAS controller cables that come from a SAS controller that's buried back in there, and that gives you an extra output here to stack other controllers. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. So you can do one and then do the second one and you can log into both of them, power them on. Now, the one kind of interesting thing is they both are attached to the same SAS channel. So these drives in the front are all on a series of SAS controllers that are parallel connected to both of the two chassis. So if you boot up Linux, for instance, both machines will see all of the drives and it's your job to figure out how to make them not collide. In other words, 
you wouldn't want to have both of them auto mount all the hard drives because they would of course clearly collide with each other. So you'll need to figure out a way to use either something like GlusterFS or something, a file system that is designed for the storage array itself being shared. And there are a number of different ways to do that. Um, I did play around a little bit with uh, a way to make it so that one chassis had all the drives mounted and was exporting, you know, a ZFS uh, storage array, SMB, all that stuff. And the second one was in a standby. And if the first one failed, it would take over and then basically take over the drives and mount and export those. And so it is certainly possible to do it that way so that one is a master and one is a backup that will kick in if the master fails. There's a bunch of things you want to do with that. One is you probably want to eventually use some IPMI automation so that if the secondary turns on, it can forcibly turn off the primary so you know that it's uh, not, uh, not running. Um, so it's something I need to experiment with a little bit. So that's one reason why I'm kind of building this up is to play around with the idea of basically two systems sharing one array. You can do the same thing with just two systems and shared SAS bus. SAS can be connected to more than one system and they can both talk to the drives. So that part isn't anything revolutionary. Um, it's just finding the right software configuration to make it work well. But even as just a file server having only one of the two chassis being the primary, it works great. You could also have each of the chassis only use, let's say, half of the drives if you needed some higher performance arrangement. Um, but that's sort of it. So it's, it's not super hard to do. It's definitely something that once you make the changes and you get the BMC working, uh, and you can log in, you can then install a normal operating system. I have tried installing a SATA M2 in here, which worked fine to give me a little more faster storage or two of those slots here. Uh, and, you know, as far as recognizing drives, all the SAS stuff is very standard, typical LSI stuff. So super easy. It has two onboard 10 gig NICs. Um, and I added some 100 gig NICs here and some 10 gig NICs there. Um, yeah, the power supplies are two of them. There's a number of different power supplies that are sold with this chassis, depending on when you buy it, what CPUs it has and how many disks it has. And so like this one here is, what is this? This one is, yeah, it's output 12 volts is 48 amps when you're powering at 120 volts or 97 amps when you're powering at 240 volts. So these work obviously massively better at 240 uh, volts than they do at 120. So you really want to run these at 240. Um, the bigger one of these, and I have one of them, I think it's 160 amps. Um, and the bigger power supplies, the biggest one at least, uh, it uses a different connector. It uses the, the one you see on Cisco routers. I forgot the number for it, but it's the slightly bigger version of the power connector. Um, and so depending on which ones you have of these, you want to sort of be, be aware of the total power used by the individual systems and then all of the drives. So if you have all SSDs, that can be quite a bit more power. Um, but running at 240 is, is really helpful. It certainly makes it uh, go a lot farther than it would be at 120 volts. So other than that, you know, the drive side, by the way, I should mention that it's, you know, these are normal little drive bays. You pop the drives and they're super easy to mount. You don't have to use any screws. Um, and these slide in like that. And they also sell these SSD trays where there's two SSDs in every one drive slot. So you pop in two SSDs into these trays and there's a little SATA bridge inside, inside this little adapter. Um, and so that allows you to get twice the density of SSDs. So you could do all SSDs if you wanted to um, or just do the uh, 24 drives that are in here in this configuration. So lots of different options of how to uh, configure it. And... I still have a lot of work to do to figure out how to make this work as a good file server. There are some, the power button is just one power button for the whole thing. Um, and over the BMC of each of the two systems, you can, of course, control the power. So you can use it to turn one or both of them off. You can also use that to configure if it turns on automatically on power up and I've experimented a little bit and it does appear that if you have that set off and you hit the power button, it will power on. But if you have both of them set that way, they'll both power on. So keep that in mind. Um, there isn't a power button for each of the two. I think the power signal is sent to both boards. Um, but other than that, it's kind of a cool chassis. I mean, it's a nice way to have a bunch of disks with um, a pair of redundant systems built into it. So I'll let you know in the next video 
how I've configured it for sort of the shared file system stuff and if I get that to work in some meaningful way. But that's a look at how it works for now.